for inviting me. And um, so uh, I will talk about uh, using Facebook for recruiting survey participants, about advantages, challenges, and uh, practical considerations. And um, what I will so the, the, my talk will have several uh, parts. The first talk I will in the first part I will talk a bit more about general considerations or general challenges that uh, we face when conducting survey research. Then in the second part, I will talk a bit uh, about how these challenges can be addressed with using uh, Facebook for participant recruitment. And here I will mostly build on or refer to work that we have been doing since March, uh, between March and August last year in the context of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And then I will close with, with some general recommendations and practical yeah, hints or advice for how to conduct similar surveys, uh, maybe on different topics. So first I start with, challenge, with talking a bit about challenges in recruiting survey participants at large. And um, so I think in the context of, of, uh, of, of, yeah, of colleagues who are mostly trained in, in sociology, I suppose, I don't think I need to, to say too much about the, the value that surveys, uh, general surveys, but also online surveys have for the research that we do in social science, but also in demography. And social science research has a long tradition on fruitfully using all kinds of, of surveys for, for you know, better understanding how the, world, how the social world works. For example, we have censuses uh, that are conducted uh, in regular intervals in many countries, countries but we have also more um, yeah, small scale but more detailed longitudinal and cohort surveys that are conducted and uh, more ad hoc surveys that address specific topics uh, that are hot at the given uh, moment. And three surveys that I would like to, to, uh, to highlight here, are, for example, the general social survey in the US, which has been running uh, for many years now, similar to the European social survey in Europe, but also more yeah, country focus or, or smaller scale uh, surveys like the surveys conducted in the context of the gender uh, generations and gender uh, program, which I think particularly for family researchers and family sociologists are uh, particularly valuable because they provide very detailed information about people's family histories, which um, is valuable for us to, to gain a better understanding of how the social world works. Now, um, while survey research has a long tradition in social science research, it's also increasingly facing challenges that are not limited to social science research, but the survey research at large, also in marketing research, economic research, economic surveys. And the first challenge is that um, the coverage of traditional sampling methods is, uh, is declining because uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to sample or to recruit people to participate in such surveys. So the response rates uh, have been decreasing considerably over the last uh, decades uh, from being very high at the very, in the very early days, for example, of telephone surveys, while nowadays it can be really difficult to recruit sufficient participants to participate in surveys via, for example, random, random, digital, uh, random digit dialing. Uh, this is partly because, on the one hand, people are less inclined uh, to participate in surveys than they were before, but also um, Sampling wire, for example, random digital dial random digit dialing is becoming more difficult because many people simply don't have a landline anymore. And so it's difficult, for example, to sample households reliably with phone registers because not every household will be listed in the phone register, which leads to not only low uh, participation rates and difficulties with sampling, but also bias possibly in the data uh, that we collect because those people who have a landline might be different from people or households that don't have a landline. This is related to increasing costs of traditional sampling methods as the samples that are, or the, the number of people that need to be contacted until the, the target sample has been completed or has been reached um, has increased considerably so that uh, sampling sufficient particip participants becomes increasingly expensive. And one additional point that has always been an issue with traditional recruitment methods is that it can be difficult to sample small subpopulations. For example, uh, or one example that's very popular in, in demographic research is, is uh, sampling migrants for survey research. And the difficulty is here, for example, if we would be interested in, in studying migrants or surveying migrants in Germany or in Poland, we would typically be hard pressed to find a sampling plan that contains um, all the migrants in the respective countries, or even um, a subset of those migrants that can be clearly and 
in advance be in the, um, identified when we just have the sampling plan uh, sampling plan in front of us so sampling are hard to reach uh, so such popula subpopulations are often hard to reach with traditional sampling plans or registers that we have population registers and this can make it very difficult and very expensive to to sample for example migrants or uh, members of the of, of queer individuals who have uh, who have uh, certain sexual identities or gender identities that are not easily to recognize or uh, infer from traditional uh, population registers. Now, in light of all these challenges, researchers increasingly advocate uh, the use of social media sites to recruit participants for survey research, and in particular, the targeted advertising facilities that those media sites often um, often offer. And I listed here a couple of examples of social media sites that have been used in earlier research. For example, uh, although the most popular uh, platform in terms of user numbers, but also in terms of use and research is arguably Facebook, which currently in the last year had uh, roughly 2.2 billion users worldwide, according to their own estimates. And um, many researchers have used this platform for um, yeah, participate, uh, recruiting participants for survey research uh, by means of the targeted uh, advertising facilities that Facebook um, offers. And I will show later a couple of ex uh, some ex examples of this. But roughly speaking, with Facebook, it's easy for researchers to create an advertising account and then uh, pay basically Facebook to deliver ads that uh, advertise, for example, a, a family related survey or migration related survey to uh, its users and then users can click on the ad and then they come to your online survey and participate in your online survey. And uh, this is very handy to uh, yeah, recruit participants for, for online research. Twitter is, has also been popular, but it's a bit less uh, smaller in terms of size, it has currently 330 million users worldwide, and has also been used less in research, partly because it's smaller, but also because the targeted advertising facilities there are a bit less elaborate than they are on Facebook. Then there's LinkedIn, and in the uh, Russian-speaking context, the Vkontakte, which is similar to Facebook, uh, has also been used for research, but much less than, than Facebook. Now, uh, in, in the second part of my presentation, I will uh, talk a bit more about these targeted advertising facilities that you get a better idea of what I'm, what I'm talking about. But before doing so, um, I would like to highlight some of the benefits that uh, scholars typically highlight when they uh, argue for the use of targeted advertisements via social uh, media for recruiting participants. The first is, uh, the wide reach of these platforms often allows the collection of diverse samples. And as I've mentioned before, for example, for Facebook, we have 2.2 billion users worldwide. And especially in Western countries, the penetration rates across countries are very high. Just to, to, to give you some numbers for uh, the US, uh, about 68% uh, of US residents are uh, currently using Facebook. In Germany, it's about 56%. And in Belgium, it's even 89% of the population. So while not everybody is using Facebook, um, typically a large part of the population are using Facebook. And uh, what's nice about Facebook is that uh, there's great diversity in terms of, of uh, educational attainment, uh, gender, but also age among the users. So it makes it possible to collect uh, diverse samples. Um, but as I will uh, tell you more about in a bit, uh, they are not necessarily re representative, but they are at least diverse. And in relation to these targeted advertisements, it's um, often you can use very detailed user information to, to create uh, yeah, your target, the targets of your advertisements, as I will show uh, in a minute. Uh, it's possible, for example, with Facebook to target, for example, people who used to live in a, in a certain country, let's say who, who used to live in Mexico, but who are now living in the US, uh, to uh, roughly approximate uh, the target group of, of possible Mexican migrants in the US and target them with your, with your surveys. So uh, in many cases, it makes it easier to, to target members of otherwise hard to reach subpopulations uh, more directly or to have at least uh, there are a higher chance of reaching these people than using other means uh, for, for participant sampling. And as I will also show uh, you later to you later in the talk or discuss later, um, this, this way of recruiting participants is typically cost, uh, cost effective and time efficient. Now, this was 
might have all been a bit, oh no, sorry, before uh, moving to the applied example, there are also some, uh, some challenges that will also illustrate a bit better uh, doing my, my applied example. First thing is that um, while many of these platforms have wide reach and make it possible to recruit a diverse sample of the population, they are often not completely representative of the, popu, uh, of the, of the population, of the general population. For example, even in Belgium where 80% uh, or, or of, of the population are using Facebook, those who do not use Facebook typically have uh, certain characteristics. They tend to be a bit older, possibly are possibly a bit uh, less educated than the average. Um, so even if these uh, platforms have wide reach, the user population often is not completely representative of the overall general population. And uh, there's a second issue um, that uh, is general for surveys, but it is often highlighted also in the context of online surveys is that we face issues of self-selection based on interest in the topic of the survey. Because we cannot force people to participate in a survey, which is a good thing, but still this creates the, the problem that we somehow need to motivate people to participate in the survey. And that leads to the problem that people who have a, a more interest in a certain topic are more likely to participate in their answers and also demographic characteristics might deviate somewhat from the overall population so that our results might be somewhat biased. And while this is a general phenomenon of, um, of, on, of, of surveys, um, using advert, uh, social media platforms and targeted advertising can reinforce the self-selection uh, problem that we have with, with surveys because um, I have here an, uh, an example from um, Facebook where they describe precisely or in more detail how their ads are delivered. When you, when you say, for example, you want to target men who are in the age range 50 to 75, uh, to, to participate in a survey and you ask Facebook to, to, to deliver ads to this uh, user group, um, the ad delivery process will not be completely randomized among uh, these, uh, these individuals. Rather, Facebook will try to increase the, the return on investment for, for advertisers, meaning that um, typically there's a short learning process, uh, le learning period involved where Facebook tries to figure out which of its users who meet your targeting criteria uh, are most likely to actually click on your ads. And then based on the characteristics of these individuals, Facebook will increasingly show the ads to people who are similar to those who have already clicked on your ads. And to the extent that these individuals who clicked on your ads in the past are different from the general Facebook user population and the population at large, this process might reinforce existing biases in your recruitment process. And in my applied example, I will, um, yeah, discuss a little bit how this uh, this additionally biasing process can be uh, can be contravened with the design of the study. Now, let me uh, so as I said, so that can be addressed with a with the study design. And now let me uh, illustrate uh, these points that I have just raised with an applied example based on our uh, COVID nineteen health, health behavior survey that we have been conducting at the Max Planck Institute between. Um, 13th of March last year and August 12th, um, in which we recruited members of the general population via Facebook to participate in a health-related survey that was focused on COVID-19 to get a better understanding um, of how people yeah, change their behavior in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. And now in the context of this seminar, I don't want to go too much into the details of, of yeah, COVID-19 and how uh, people uh, reacted uh, to the pandemic, but I rather want to focus on the methodological aspects of the survey, because I think this is uh, uh, probably of most interest for you. Just for, for, for context, uh, why we conducted the study, the reason is that um, uh, especially before vaccines became available, um, the, the measures that were available to mitigate the pandemic and to reduce the pressure on, on, on uh, intensive care units were non-medical interventions as for example, lockdowns or uh, where re the recommend, uh, recommendation to wear masks to basically slow down the, the infection and um, thereby to reduce the pressure on the health system until vaccines as they're now available became actually available. And um, these measures require active compliance by the population and uh, measuring this compliance and factors that might affect compliance uh, with 
is partially possible with, with digital trace data. For example, Google movement data have been uh, used for assessing uh, whether or not people have reduced their movements, uh, have, uh, their daily movements as a reaction to uh, government lockdowns. But with this data, it's still difficult to, to understand the motivations and particularly to understand why some people adhered to certain recommendations and others not. And we argued that, or we believe that surveys are uniquely positioned to, to gain such insights, to ask people, okay, have you done something? Uh, assuming that they answer somewhat uh, reliably and honestly, also asking why they did something or did not do something to get a better, better understanding of not only what people did, but also why they did it. And if you want to learn a bit more about this, I list here three uh, papers that have come out since we started the survey. And on my website, you can uh, actually uh, find the links to the paper so that you don't have to take notes right now. Now, um, before I start uh, with talking about the survey itself, I just want to briefly give you a brief idea of the Facebook Ads Manager, because I think many people have heard about Facebook surveys or researchers using Facebook ads to target uh, people for participa participating in a survey, but only a few people will have actually seen what this ads manage or what these ads look like or how the process of creating an ad looks like. And um, what you need to use in particular Facebook to, to uh, recruit participants or to launch targeted ads to pa recruit participants is just a personal uh, Facebook account, uh, a credit card. And with that, you're set to, to create uh, ad account that's linked to your personal account, which you can use right away to launch ads that can be uh, directed at anybody who uses Facebook. So the barrier to setting up an advertising account are arguably very low, all you need is a personal Facebook account and a credit card. And once you have created this, this advertising account, you can create advertising campaigns. And when you do so, you get uh, something that looks like this, this interface where you create, where you can define, okay, who should see my ads? And here you can, in the first step, determine where should, the, where, what's the, the geographic area that I want to target. And here, uh, for illustration, I focus on the United, State, the United States and the state of California, which you see here highlighted what Facebook considers as belonging to the state of California. I could have uh, added, uh, added um, other states of the US to this. I could have just focused on the US as a whole, but I could also have uh, focused on smaller areas like specific cities, zip codes, or even um, yeah, geographic regions that I could have defined with an area around a certain longitude uh, and latitude. So this is very uh, flexible, but Facebook also offers, us, offers some handy uh, pre-established um, geographic areas that you can use for targeting uh, people. Then you can, at a, at a very basic level, define the age range uh, of people that should be, should be shown your ads. You can determine their gender. Here, I'm not, uh, to be honest, not sure how much gender uh, coincides with sex. Um, so I think it's not uh, perfectly aligned with individual sex, but typically, uh, on experience, uh, the gender is in 99% congruent with what people report what their actual sex is. So, but it's important to keep in mind that we're talking here about gender and not necessarily sex. And then, which what might what might be most interesting for for uh, specific targeting of subgroups is Facebook has this this ad or this detailed targeting criteria where you can, for example, focus on demographics. And then on the relationship status, and you can focus within California among people who are 20 to 64 years old, among all those who are divorced. And then you get uh, an estimate by Facebook that uh, there are roughly 51,000 people of its of 51,000 of its users uh, meet these criteria in California. And here I just set the daily budget of 20, 20 euros for, for, long, for running my ads on a daily basis. So, and then you get an estimate that based on this budget, uh, roughly 1.5,000 to roughly 4,000 people would see my ads on a daily basis. And I could expect roughly 13 to 41 clicks on my ads. And um, this is then what the ads look like. So I included this image because uh, not everybody is a Facebook user. So not everybody might, uh, might have an idea what Facebook looks like once you... So this is the, 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 day, the, the news feed that users get. This is my personal news feed and I blanked out some, some areas, contain personal information, but in general, the news feed looks like this. And then 
Uh, the most prominent advertising areas are uh, ads in the newsfeed. And here, Facebook knows that I'm uh, interested in climbing. Therefore, I get advertisements directed at people who were uh, interested in climbing here in German language because I'm located in Germany. But you also get these uh, smaller ads in the, in the margin. Um, and you can determine whether people should see your ads only in the center or also in the margin. And you can also... Uh, determine, a number, determine a number of other placements that I don't want to discuss in detail here. But in theory, you could also use, uh, as Instagram belongs to Facebook, you could also show your, uh, your ads on Instagram. Um, but so far, I'm not aware that many people have actually done that in research. Typically, the focus is on, on Facebook users, not so much on Instagram users. Okay, and then um, now a bit more detail about what we did. Um, what you see here on the left-hand side uh, is an example of the ads that we launched. And we ran our campaign in, in eight countries, uh, namely Belgium, Germany, Spain, France, Italy, the Netherlands, the UK, and the United States. And the ad that you see here is, uh, is an example of the ads that we ran uh, in the US. And they were local, uh, uh, localized lang and language-wise so that we generally had the, the, gener the, the same message across the countries, but then obviously in the respective languages, uh, like German in Germany, but in Belgium, if there were multiple languages like in, in Belgium, we had the ads in three languages and we let um, Facebook decide which language to use de depending on the language settings of the Facebook users. And as I mentioned before, the survey was running continuously between March 13 and August 12, 2020. And the survey focused on social demographic characteristics, attitudes in relation to COVID-19, behavior in relation to COVID-19, uh, respondents' health, and social contacts and their social contacts that they had the day before the survey. And over the entire period, we recruited roughly 144,000 individuals who completed the questionnaire. So this is the number of completed questionnaires where many more participants or yeah, many more participants, but not everybody completed uh, the survey in the end. And uh, one important point, the survey uh, was anonymous, so uh, we don't uh, know uh, the identities of the individuals. And also Facebook did not provide us with personal information about the, of, about the users, which it generally does not do with, uh, with, uh, with ads. So for advertisers, it's not possible to access the personal information of uh, Facebook users. Um, okay, how, what did or advertising campaigns look like. And this is now important in relation to the representativeness of the sample, because as I mentioned before, first, the user population of Facebook might not be completely representative of the national populations of the respective countries. But for us, it was important to get somewhat representative samples of the respective uh, populations, because we wanted to have a population, a population survey that's valid for the entire population. And as I mentioned before, as you might remember, Facebook's advertising algorithms leads to a situation where if, for example, people who live in the West of the US who are male and 18 to 24 years old are especially likely to click on our ads, Facebook will over time increasingly show these individuals our ads, which means that over time it might be that our entire budget is spent on people who are male and young at the expense of people who are female and older, for example. And uh, to avoid this, uh, we followed uh, recommendations from earlier research by stratifying our advertising campaigns at a country level, meaning that we created one campaign per country, here the United States, it's an example. And within the country, we created uh, a stratified ad set. So at the ad sets is the level at which you define the characteristics of the users who should see your ad, and you can have multiple target groups within one campaign. And here we stratified these ad sets by user sex, male, female, or gender, as Facebook uses the term, and then by four age groups, uh, 18 to 24, 25 to 44, 44 to 64, and then 65 plus, because from 65 plus on Facebook does not mm, uh, differentiate its users anymore uh, to maintain their privacy. And then within each country, we had between three to four uh, regions. And this is the example of the US where we had uh, four regions um, so that we had one, uh, uh, we had uh, different uh, um, ad sets for, sex, for the different combinations of sex and age for each of the four regions leading to a cross countries between 24 and I think 52 uh, ad sets so that we would make sure that um, Facebook shows our ads to each of these demographic groups. 
And then within each ad set, we had six images to make sure that we appeal to a large group of, uh, of users, even if they are not too much interested in, uh, in COVID-19. So in the first step, uh, we ensured that we have uh, we sample potentially from the entire population. We made sure that uh, we countervene this self-reinforced process of the uh, advertising algorithm that potentially uh, reinforces biases. And then we had six ad images and these ad images um, we selected to make sure that, the, that we get a diverse sample in terms of interest in relation to COVID-19. So we selected two images. So all our images were related to health behavior uh, to not confuse people why we show them, for example, an image about cars. If we are interested in the health behavior, that would have probably been uh, uh, strange for participants. So we made sure that the images are related to health behavior, but uh, we included images that were both related to COVID-19 very explicitly, the last two images, five and six, two images that were only yeah, indirectly to co related to COVID-19, the two in the middle, woman blowing his, her nose and a couple blowing their noses, and then two images that were related to, to health at large. And we did this to ensure that we do not get people, only people who are very strongly interested in COVID-19, because this is a very salient topic, but also people who are, might be generally interested in health topics um, to get, make sure that we get a somewhat diverse sample in terms of interested in health, interest in health behavior in COVID-19. Um, and then in the last step, um, so in the design, we made sure that we get diverse samples that are somewhat representative of the entire population, but then still uh, we expected that our, um, our samples would be, might be somewhat biased or at least not representative so that we might undersample, for example, somewhat younger people because we know that younger people are less interested in health related service than older people. And therefore um, we ensured that in each of the strata that we collected, we had a sufficient number of participants to apply post stratification weighting where we basically at the stratum level across countries weighted the data in our analysis based on, uh, on gold standard data like uh, Eurostat data on population uh, estimates. So that uh, based on the answers that we got, we would be able to approximate a representative sample of the entire population, keeping in mind that still Facebook users might be different from the general population and unobserved characteristics like um, internet, uh, internet skills um, or uh, yeah, sociability and these things that we cannot easily measure with uh, such data like uh, data from Eurostat on uh, demographic characteristics of the population. So to summarize, these were the steps that we took to uh, address these challenges that collecting data would uh, in general, or collecting uh, samples in general, but in particular also collecting uh, samples for surveys with social online media or social media networks uh, create. Um, how did our campaigns perform? Mm. So this is a nice thing about Facebook compared to, so you could also partic uh, recruit participants uh, with an open survey that you share, for example, via uh, yeah, discussion groups or informal networks to, to circulate it widely or via uh, media posts, but there you don't get really an idea of who was uh, eligible or who has seen your ads and who actually decided to participate. With Facebook, <clears throat> it's, it's a nice feature. You get performance estimates for your campaigns or for your advertising campaigns, and you get also uh, estimates mm -hmm. like, so how many people have seen your uh, ads on a given day? how many actually participated and so on and so on and so on. And what you see here is uh, a performance measure that's provided by Facebook. That's the so-called click-through rate, which is calculated as the share of people who had seen the ads who actually clicked on the ads. So if, that's, if the click-through rate is 0.2, roughly 20% of all the people who had seen your ads or who, who at least had the chance to see your ad in your timeline, whether they actually looked at it or not is a different matter, but it appeared in your timeline and then actually clicked on it. And what you see here is that over time, participation behavior changed. So especially in the beginning when COVID-19 was a very uh, new topic and uh, infection rates were very high in, uh, in spring last year, participation rates were very high or the click-through rate was very high. So meaning that people were very likely to click on our ads. However, over time, towards summer, participation rates declined or the click-through rate declined. 
Uh, arguably, we expect that this is because people got a bit used to the topic and also during summer infection rates somewhat decreased across countries, thereby rendering this topic less salient and less interesting for people. But towards winter or towards late summer when infection rates picked up again, uh, also the interest uh, of people in increased again in a survey and the click-through rate increased. So this is also something to keep in mind when interpreting our results over time, that the salience of the topic varied arguably somewhat over time. And now I talked about the click-through rate and I accidentally used the term participation rates, um, should not have done that because here I talk about response rates. And uh, to be clear, calculating traditional response rates, even with the, Facebook, with the data that Facebook provides is difficult because you do not really know whether people had seen your ads. However, we can calculate something that approximates something like resp traditional response rates from traditional survey, which we calculate here namely as the share of Facebook users who completed the questionnaire after clicking on the ad. So we don't know whether somebody uh, who was targeted by your ad actually had seen the ads in the timeline or they just scrolled through. But for those people who clicked on the ad, therefore arrived at the survey, we know whether or not they com completed the survey. And we take this here as a rough estimate of a response rate. And response rates were generally high, but they varied uh, by sex, with women being more likely to complete the survey once they arrived at it than men. Um, Younger and middle-aged people were more likely to participate once they arrived at the survey. And um, in Spain, participation rates were, or response rates, sorry, were particularly uh, low. And we still don't know why this was the case. So Spain is here somewhat an outlier. But if you want to know more, more about this, you can uh, please refer to our uh, working paper on the uh, on Med Archive. And uh, just to illustrate you, uh, to illustrate some of the substantive results that we obtained, uh, for example, <clears throat> we were interested in um, how much of a threat do people perceive COVID-19 to pose for different levels of society, because this information could give us an idea uh, as to why people, some people might be more or less likely to stick with certain rules or to comply with certain rules. And um, this is a question that we took from an Ipsos poll that was conducted during the early uh, days of the pandemic. Here we asked respondents how large they perceive the threat that COVID-19 poses to the world, the country, the local community, them personally or their family. And with our survey, we were able to, to uh, show such difference or to find such differences. So like, for example, what you see here is uh, we plot a standardized, so we this was a, five point Likert type scale, we standardized that to the range uh, zero to one. Um, and then we plotted the perceived, the, uh, the threat perception that men on average reported against the threat perception that women on average uh, reported and then broke that down by threat for the self, family, community, country and world and broke that further down by age. And what you see here is that generally women's and men's uh, threat perceptions are somewhat aligned, but generally uh, women uh, perceive COVID uh, more of a threat than men. Younger people perceive COVID-19 less of a threat than older individuals. And interestingly, people perceive uh, COVID-19 less of a threat to themselves than they perceive it for their family, their community, and ultimately the world. And this is actually aligned with what we see with uh, uh, threat perceptions or, or yeah, vulner vulnerability perceptions with uh, infectious diseases at large. So COVID-19 does not seem to be much of, a, of an outlier there in this regard. Then as a second illustration, uh, this is something that we were particularly keen on is uh, con collecting uh, yeah, continuous data on people's contacts with other members of the, of the community. And here we ask people to report the number of contacts they had with other people uh, in certain contexts, the day before uh, the, the survey, namely at home, at school, at work, or uh, in other contexts. And uh, given that we collected the data for con uh, continuously on a daily basis for a long period, we could create such plots uh, that show how contact behavior changed over time across, uh, across the months. And here you see the average number of daily contacts uh, by setting, namely at home in red, and outside the home in, in, uh, in blue. And you see, as you would expect that, if, especially in the beginning, 
people uh, limited their contacts with other people uh, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, but later as the infection rate decreased, uh, contact numbers increased again. And this can be used to, for example, inform simulation models of contact behavior that are uh, relevant for, uh, for the studying or modeling the, the, um, the spread of the, of the virus throughout the population over time. Now, um, to conclude, I think I have five minutes left. Um, so what were the main, what, what were arguably, from my point of view, the main benefits of our approach or of this approach in general? First, we were able to, to implement uh, the survey timely. So creating a Facebook advertising campaign can be done quickly. And in all, in, all in all, it took us about three weeks from idea to start. So this, is, so this three week is not a general recommendation. It would be good if you have more time to, to think about your survey. But in this particular context, um, <clears throat> this approach enabled us to quickly launch our, our ad uh, or our survey. For example, um, I'm aware that there are many, many of the bigger surveys uh, survey efforts that uh, take uh, probabilistic samples of the population have by now included questions about uh, COVID-19. But this took some time <clears throat> and this took a couple of months uh, to be realized. And in all case, we were able to launch the survey quickly to already start uh, collecting the data, considering the, the pros and cons of doing so. At least we, we were able to, to start quickly and have uh, timely data available from the early phases of the pandemic. Then uh, in terms of coverage, uh, the use of Facebook made it possible for us to collect data in many countries. We were considering including more countries, but at some point uh, we realized that our team was too small to add more countries, but this would have been uh, potentially possible. So this is a plus, I think. And as I mentioned before, coverage is or penetration of Facebook is large in the countries that we considered. Um, Facebook is the most representative of all social media platforms and we reached members of all sexes, age groups and geographic regions within countries. And uh, this is something I mentioned before. Uh, our survey was cost effective. As I said, we collected roughly 140,000 completed questionnaires and the cost per click, which is the metric that Facebook uses to, to, to bill uh, your ad, uh, to create bills for your ad, is, uh, was 14 euro cents. So that means on average, we paid 14 cents for every click of the participants, not considering how many people had actually seen the ad. So here we only, it's only considered whether people clicked on the ads or not. And considering that not everybody who clicks on the ad actually participates in the survey and completes the questionnaire, um, the, the cost per completed questionnaire was roughly one euro five, which is um, cheaper than, uh, than comparable surveys that are uh, conduct their sampling by, by other means. And uh, so this is now something uh, that goes beyond the COVID-19 health behavior survey and uh, that we might maybe discuss uh, after my talk. Um, I mentioned before this possibility to target hard to reach subpopulations. Here we did not do that because we wanted to uh, get a somewhat or uh, roughly representative sample of the general population, but it would have been possible to sample certain subgroups if we would have been interested in um, their response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So for example, Stefan Pötschke and Michael Braun uh, uh, three years ago or a couple of years ago, sample used Facebook targeted advertisements to uh, sample migrants across Europe, Polish migrants, I think, um, from Europe very successfully, uh, across Europe very successfully. And we could have done something similar if you would have been interested in um, the COVID-19 experiences of migrants across Europe. So maybe we can talk about this in the discussion. And um, I would like to close with some practical considerations. First, while Facebook enables you to, to create many fine-grained strata, and this is advisable to make sure that you get a diverse sample of the population and to counterbalance this self-reinforcing biasing uh, advertising mechanism, you should mind the number of strata that you create because the more strata you have, the higher will be your cost to reach a certain minimum number of participants within the strata to apply, for example, um, post-stratification weighting or conduct meaningful analysis on the different strata. Then that's often neglected and not mentioned in existing papers is you need to engage with Facebook users. Uh, because if you show an ad, that's like a, like a post and people can comment and react to your, your posts. And uh, this might affect participation behavior of prospective participants. So, um, in all case, we got roughly, I noted that down um, across the eight countries, just to see my notes, 
We got uh, our ads got across countries roughly 19,300 impressions per day and 135 comments per day. And it took us roughly one hour of managing 50 to 100 comments per day and that over a period of five months. So we hired uh, student assistants at some point to, to help us with that uh, after instructing them. Uh, but this is something depending on the size of your survey, this should not be uh, underestimated the effort that this takes. And you should schedule enough time because uh, before you can launch your app, your ads, your ads will be reviewed internally by Facebook for compliance with their advertising standards. This usually takes less than a day, but sometimes it can take a bit longer. So you should schedule two to three days, uh, allow three, two to three days for this process. And also sometimes your ads are rejected because Facebook thinks you are violating some of their, um, their policy. And this might considerably delay um, your, your study.